Hello and welcome to Almost 30 Podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. It's Lindsay and Krista, and we're happy you're here. Greetings. Welcome to the world. We're in New York City. Yeah, baby. How are you feeling in New York? This is your second to last day. Mm-hmm. I brought the sun. Uh-huh. I bring the good weather wherever I go, and it's absolutely storming in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's kind of so scary there. Good. I feel like every time I'm here, I don't know how I lived here, to be honest. Mm, tell me more. It's an abusive environment. Mm. Yeah, to be in the thick of the city is a wild I time. do like walking a lot. I do feel like I've been getting so many steps, which I really, really love. And all the food places and all the people. I mean, it is kind of a vibe. But yeah, I think if you've been out of it for a bit, it's the the sounds yeah. are really intense. I, no- I noticed that when I'm on like an important call and I'm walking in the city, I'm like... Uh, can everyone turn down the volume? Oh like, gosh. what is wrong with people? Yeah. Or if I'm like walking Mav, I'm like, it is so loud. <laughs> As you're like, my baby is sleeping. <laughs> I'll literally like look at trucks and be like, are you serious? Yeah. Like, I have a baby in here. Like, do you see this face? Um, but the sounds, the smells. Dude, yesterday... I mean, this is anywhere with Ubers. And I think they should add this as like a comfort setting or some setting on Uber. A good scent. No, a no scent. Because I had a headache for hours. I took two Ubers yesterday, two and from here. And it was the cologne Mm. and fragrance in the car both ways. I was unwell. I think we, I honestly think when you're like a non toxic gir- wellness girl, yeah. you become so sensitive. So to that. sensitive. I remember we had Natalia's birthday party and we had it at this Airbnb that we rented and they had used bleach as a cleaner and all of us were unwell. Yes, I know. We were, uh, we had to leave early. We were like, ah, ah, we can't do this. I would <laughs> much crazy. rather BO than a cologne. I completely agree with that statement. Because I'm like, that's your natural body odor. It's not going to kill me. As someone that sometimes probably has BO, I don't mind. (laughs) Don't (laughs) care. I don't mind. But I was just laughing. Um, We just did an interview and it's coming out like a random time so it won't even align to this. But just someone, when I ask a question, someone being like, you're so interesting. (laughs) (laughs) She's like, you're asking me. It's like basically was alluding that I ask personal things. Yeah. And I do. Uh, yeah, we're in an interview, know, but I think she wasn't used to that. She's used totally. to stating the question facts answer. and the research yes. and the question and answer. And she's so good at that. And I think she was like, whoa, like I'm about to talk about like my childhood. Yeah. I just forget about people being, no, I don't forget about people yes. being different than me. I, I'm very aware of that. But I forget about people not wanting to talk about the deep things. Sure. I think because I'm so deep in like, I like to process human interactions. Like I love understanding Mm -hmm. psychology of things. And I just thought that was so funny to like stop the interview. And she's like, you're so interesting. And I was like, why? Well, I did pick up on two things that were happening Uh in her life. But um, yeah, it was just fascinating. But today, I'm really excited. We have Najwa Zibian on the podcast. She got to come into the studio in Los Angeles with me to talk about her book, The Only Constant. Um, We were connected to her through Tess, who was our book agent that got us our book deal. We love her so much. Mm -hmm. Tess is incredible. Shout out, Tess. And um, Najwa in this conversation was really about our relationship to change, which is something that's interesting because we've talked about that quite a bit. Because Almost 30 Podcast was started during our transition from our 20s to our 30s, when there's a lot of change going on in your life. Um, And we feel like, personally, and this seemed like the same opinion of Najwa, that having a better relationship to change will change your life, essentially. Seeing change as an opportunity, seeing change as something that's really beautiful, as something that's going to lead you to a better life, Mm -hmm. is like such a powerful way to be. And I feel like my separation and all the changes that I've gone through in the past couple years— have made me rethink my relationship to change. And now I'm like so excited for yes. it. I see it as something that brings more of the life that I want, more of my dream life, more possibility, more abundance, more opportunities, more aligned friendships, more love than before. I was like, I'm so scared of yes. change. And it's so weird to think how scared I was of change when like I didn't love my life. You know, when I was working in corporate world or I was in relationships that weren't aligned or I was in friendships that weren't aligned or didn't have good mental health, Mm -hmm. I would be afraid of change, but yet I wasn't even happy. So it's like, you need change to have better change. Yeah, and I think we perceive that when something changes, like it will uproot and disturb everything within us, Yeah, you know? And so I think we hold on to what is and we become so attached Mm -hmm. because that's more comfortable than what we perceive as the change. But really the change is the beginnings of what could be 
a better situation, a better relationship, um, better health, et cetera. And yeah, I think similar to you, we've both been in seasons of change. And I think it's it's been nice to have that like repeated exposure of things changing yeah. because I'm like, oh, cool. It's like practice. It's like a muscle within us that I'm like, okay, cool. This hasn't been worked in a little bit. I'm actually, I'm, at, I'm liking this. It is intense at times, but I have the tools and I have the relationships and the resources to be able to like lean on and lean into during these times so that, you know, I feel supported and I don't feel alone, but I also feel really good within myself mm -hmm. to navigate these periods of change because I keep doing it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's the thing that's helped me have a good relationship with change is to always have me. And that's such a somatic, like felt sense experience to have yourself, to have your own back, to trust yourself enough to know that you're going to do the right thing or you're going to do the um, most loving thing or you're going to do the most self-respecting thing in every situation. And when you don't have that secure attachment with yourself, it's really hard to navigate life. And it's oh. really hard to navigate change because you kind of feel unstable with everything. You're like, I'm unstable internally. I'm unstable externally. Where is my mm -hmm. center and where is my home? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that concept of finding your center, I didn't get hip to until... I think like after our Saturn return, but yeah. um, to I would know, have had no idea what we were talking about. Before. I know. I'd be like, okay, so it's like, like find my boyfriend it's a pole in the yeah. middle of my body. That I'd I be like, my find. center is him. <laughs> <laughs> but it is such a felt sense, and it's very even hard to describe. But to to return there over and over during every season of change is like such a gift. Mm -hmm. I think that you know everyone should be able to experience. Um, and I love this. I love the title of this book, The Only Constant, because it is so freaking true. Um, One of the quotes from the book that I really love was, accept change before it makes you reject your reality. Choose change before it chooses you. Embrace change so it can lead you to your authentic life. And I really do feel like if you're not making the change, God's going to come in and just mm -hmm. do his thing. God mm -hmm. will make the change for you if you're not listening to your intuition, to your gut, to your soul. And I've noticed that in my life, the more conscious I've been and the more collaborative I've been with my soul, I can work with my soul, God, my higher self, to navigate to the change that I want in my life, mm -hmm. to be fine-tuned to like the highest timeline, to be fine-tuned to the experience that I want, rather than like having my life have to blow up so that yeah. I make change. Yeah. And I think sometimes you have to experience that little blow up in order to understand, you yeah. know, like experience that contrast yeah. um, in order to come back. But yeah, I'm thankful we're having these conversations. I feel like people in our community are constantly going through those mm -hmm. transitions. So we talked about her book, The Only Constant is Change. We also talked a lot about relationships. Mm -hmm. So she's talked about relationships in the past of her career. Um and in the context of relationships, we talked about toxic relationships. We talked about um, harmful relationship dynamics. We talked about not losing yourself. So this is definitely like a love relationships lens because she's talked so much about that in her career and then talking about change. So I think people are really going to love their relationships and love piece because we just really went in on that. And for anyone that doesn't know Najwa Zebian, she's a Lebanese Canadian activist. She's an author, speaker, and educator. She has a doctorate in educational leadership. She's actually written four books that guide readers to navigate hard emotions and most recently wrote the book, Welcome Home. She also did the TEDx talk, Finding Home Through Poetry. So she's a poet, which is amazing. And she has a podcast called In the Clear. And she's just such a doll. She's mm -hmm. incredible. The TEDx talk is really, really powerful. And her Instagram is super powerful. Her Instagram is Nejwa Zebian. That's N-A-J-W-A-Z-E-B-I-N on Instagram. Beautiful. Thank you all for listening. If you love this one, please, please share it with a friend. It's always so nice to start conversations about anything you hear on the podcast that deeply, deeply impacts you. Thank you for being just the best friends here at almost 30, almost 30.com to learn more about what we're doing over here. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok at almost 30 podcast. Yeah. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. Bye. This episode is brought to you by IQ bar. Yo, IQ bar has completely changed the snack game for me. 
I am always on a quest to find bars that are healthy, that are yummy, and that are really good for me. I find that I flip over to the nutritional facts on most bars out there and I find crap, (laughs) but not in IQ bars. And I'm really happy to introduce them to you. These are plant protein bars that are brain boosting. They are great for before a workout. They're great for a breakfast. Um, They are yummy and chewy and my favorite thing. I have them with me wherever I go. I love the banana nut, the lemon blueberry two of my favorites. These bars are vegan, gluten-free, and low in sugar and carbs, really high quality ingredients. uh, And I think you're going to love it. I also love their IQ Joe. These are uh, coffee mixes, like single serving coffee mixes that do not give me the jitters. So I'm doing one cup of coffee a day and I'm using the IQ Joe. This helps you sustain energy. Why? Because in the IQ Joe, there is brain boosting magnesium and productivity enhancing lion's mane. So it's a real balance. It comes in four different flavors, original black, vanilla spice, cafe mocha, and toasted hazelnut. I love it. It's one of my favorite things. So check them out. You can refuel smarter in 2024 with IQ Bar's Ultimate Sampler Pack. That's seven IQ Bars, four IQ Mix Sticks, and four IQ Joe Sticks. And now... Our special podcast listeners get 20% off all IQ Bar products, plus get free shipping. To get your 20% off, just text ALMOST to 64000. Get your discount right now. I know you have your phone near you. Text A-L-M-O-S-T to 64000. That's ALMOST to 64000. Message and data rates may apply. See terms for details. Okay, taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the last four years, I've been drinking AG1 every day. No exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day. And it makes me feel so good, so energized. I'm focused. I am regular. I feel strong. I'm just ready to take on the day. And that's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a super powerful, healthy habit that also is powerfully simple. Um, And I I really trust AG1 to support my whole body health. I am getting essential brain, gut, and immune health support with the vitamins, the probiotics, and the nutrients from whole foods. And they are so obsessed with quality. Every batch of AG1 goes through a rigorous testing process so you know it's safe, and their ingredients are sourced for absorption, potency, and nutrient density. Uh, You got to be careful out in the marketplace now. There are so many supplements and products and not all of them care as much as AG1 about the quality. So if there's one product I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. And that's why we've partnered with them for so long. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 and K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash almost 30. That's drink ag1.com slash almost 30. Check it out. All right. I'm so excited for this one. I felt like when your book came through my inbox from the amazing Tess and you were talking about change, I just felt like it's been something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. And it almost feels like a lot of the undercurrent of the conversations that we're having in so many different areas whether it's relationships or whether it's self-development or whether it's the world, like Mm -hmm. what we want to happen in the world. And I think we overlook change Mm -hmm. and the way that we see it and the way that we relate to it. I think that we all say that we want it, but when it comes, we're scared. And I think that we all visualize and desire to live big lives that are beautiful with people Mm -hmm. that we love, but we're afraid to do the things that it takes to get there. What was the inspiration for you writing about change in particular? Because there's so many things you could write about because you know so much. Why was it change that you were like, this is it? At that point in my life, I had been going through quite a few changes in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, For the few years before that, I had changed my lifestyle completely. I used to be religious. I used to be Um, a rule follower. Mm -hmm. And I started breaking the rules bit by bit. And so I had been going through the process of change and shedding layers of past patterning and, you know, falling into trauma bonds Mm -hmm. and not just with uh, romantic partners, but family members, friends, bosses. And so 
I had experienced all of this change and I felt like now was the time for me to actually write about it. And it seemed like everything aligned. Um, right before I started writing The Only Constant, my grandma passed away. And uh, I had written a few pages. And then when that happened, when I got the call that she was no longer here, it was one of the biggest wake-up calls of my life because it got me to reflect on this beautiful, great love that I had, this unconditional love. I started getting memories back of when I was young and I would just run to her and put my head in her lap and she would just, you know, play with my hair mm. and go to the back and get me my favorite plate of fruits. And just, I had this beautiful, unconditional love that's now gone. And I had spent so many years worrying about other love that was conditional, that was toxic, that was extremely controlling, that was extremely unavailable. And I sat down with myself one night mm -hmm. just thinking about her and feeling like I was wrapped like with her arms. And I thought, if I want to live a life like the one she lived, if I want to live a life that has the kind of love that she and my grandpa had, which it's it's such pure love. Like after she passed away, I was sitting there with my grandpa and, um, you know, there were a few family friends and this one woman uh, says to my grandpa, she noticed that he was crying. So he had been with my grandma for like 75 years. She's his best friend. So this woman looks at him and says, um, it's wrong to cry. Yeah, because, I knew something was coming. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, oh. don't cry. It's like you're not accepting God's will. And uh, my grandpa looked at her and, and I actually wrote about this in The Only Constant. Um, I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. He looked at the woman and then he looked at a at an electric pole like across the street and he's like you see that pole right there two birds used to come and stand right at the top of that light every day and then one day one of them was flying and it flew too low and a stray cat attacked it and ate it and the other bird still comes here every day and looks down exactly at the spot where its partner was killed if a bird can do that for another bird you don't mm. think that I should cry over the woman that I loved for 75 years. Like that broke me to hear that. So when I was reflecting on that kind of love, I was like, what would it take for me to have that kind of love in my life? It obviously isn't just about thinking about my life right now. It's about thinking and about my whole life. So for me to get that kind of love, I would have to want to live a life that has that kind of love in, a, in an ongoing, overflowing kind of way. It can't just be a goal for this coming year or for the next five years. It has to be a life that's full of that kind of love. So that was one of the first things I wrote about in The Only Constant is that change is hard because we focus so much on how able we are to achieve a goal mm -hmm. as opposed to change being the path to the life that we want. Mm -hmm. Like when you stop focusing on how difficult making this change is and start telling yourself, that's actually the only way that I will be able to get to the life I want. Then you're tying it to this bigger theme where you don't want to wake up one day when you're 70 or 80 or 90 and look back at the life you lived and say to yourself, you know, I, I wish I actually lived the life that I wanted to live. I wish I took that risk and made that change and let go of that person or that job or that dream of who I thought I needed to be. I wish I did all of that. So think of that. Close your eyes and feel what it feels like to live the life that you know. One day you're going to look back and say, I wish I lived this life. Feel what it feels like. And that feeling should motivate you to look at those changes as just their steps. It's a journey. It's a process for me to get to that place. I'm not just going to focus on how hard it's going to be to achieve this one thing, you know? 
I'm going to focus on how beautiful my life is going to be in the aftermath. <laughs> yeah, I feel like people see change as like a punishment instead yes. of possibility. Mm -hmm. What do you think is happening or why do you think our programming is such where we really are afraid of what's going to happen if things change rather than being like, oh yeah, this is the gateway to greater? We don't like change because it's uncertain. Mm -hmm. We don't like change because we're afraid that the worst possible outcome could happen. We don't like change because our bodies at a cellular level resist anything that's different from what they've always known. So in the only constant, I talk about differentiating between the safety that your body feels, the kind of safety. We all know this. If you were in a toxic relationship of any sort, you know that when you're with that person, that moment, like the first time they yell at you, the first time they lie to your face, when you know the truth, the first time they try to like change your understanding of who you are and you're so aware of it, but at the same time, there's something in your body that's like, I know this feeling. So that safety is protective. It's like, I know how to deal with this. I know how to get through it. I know that I need to be quiet. I know I need to just brush it off. I, need, I know I need to pretend like it's not affecting me. It's safe because I know how to protect myself. There's a different kind of safety, though, and that's the kind of safety that we need to train our bodies by becoming aware of that old definition of safety and familiarity. We need to train our bodies to want the kind of safety that's like, expansive, not the one that's constrictive. I'm protecting myself. The one that's like, I can be vulnerable. I can open my heart. I can feel my feelings. I can express myself. I can live my truth safely. All of that is welcome. So when our bodies resist change and fear change and want the validation of other people that our choices for ourselves are okay, like, you know, we all have a few people in our lives who the first time we think of that change, we're like, oh, what are they going to think? Mm -hmm. How are they going to react to this? When we don't know who we truly are and worse, actually, I'm not going to say worse because I, I don't like using good and bad. When you don't know who you are and when you don't accept yourself mm -hmm. fully and when you're not self-aware and then there's the fear. And there's the uncertainty. It's like, okay, I will not change. I will not make that change because all of these things are in the way. There's one question that I have in the only constant that I got goosebumps the very first time that I thought about it. And it goes, what if the safety net appears after you jump? Mm. Like, what if the answer comes mm. after you take the leap mm -hmm. of asking the question? Mm -hmm. What if the beauty of that change comes into your life and you feel it after you take the risk to do what you know you need to take? Maybe you can't see that safety net. Maybe you're like, if I take this leap, I'm going to fall flat on my face. But maybe you take the leap and then the safety net appears. Maybe you can trust that you will find the resources that you need as you're going through this, like many times we think to ourselves, I can't make this change unless I'm ready. I have to have everything yeah. figured out. I, I need mm -hmm. to know everything. It's that uncertainty part, right? We don't <clears throat> like unfinished stories. We don't like movies that have no clear ending. It's just how we are. We like certainty. We like to know if I do this, this is going to happen. So you have to trust that maybe you make a choice to change something in your life and the things that will happen in your life after that are going to be so much more beautiful than you ever thought they could be. And if they are not, you have to trust that you have the ability to navigate that. You have the ability to get through that. And I ask everybody who's reading, I say, reflect on the number of people in your life who you've given permission to lead you either um, directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. So people whose opinions you care so much about, people who've made rules for you. How many people in your life have you trusted 
to lead you and you are just following them, following their dream for you in life, following what they think you need to be like as a partner, following what they think the best job for you is. So you've trusted those people for as long as you did. They've messed up because they're not perfect. They've maybe even misled you. Like if you're in a toxic relationship, mm -hmm. for example, maybe this person completely shattered your image of who you actually are, but you still trusted them to lead you somewhere, maybe to your self-worth, maybe to mm -hmm. a better place in life, whatever, you trusted them, right? So if you've given yourself permission to trust other people for as long as you have when they've led you imperfectly and wrongly at times, why can you not give yourself the grace to be the imperfect leader of your life? Mm. The wrong at times leader of your life. If you can trust others, you can trust yourself. If you can give someone else in your life grace when they mess up, you can, you can do that to yourself too. Mm. <laughs> there were so many things in there. I was like, okay, I want to say this about this. I want to say this about this. But I think for so many people, that familiar feeling that we talked about before of safety, mm -hmm. it's it's not conscious awareness. You know, I mm -hmm. think people, what what I'm always so fascinated about in relationships in particular is that our consciousness is what allows us to shift everything. Yes. So for so many people, they're in situations where it is from, and I've been like this myself, toxic relationship that seemed familiar, but actually, and seemed safe, but was actually not good mm -hmm. for me. What do you think are ways people can start to notice themselves in toxic relationships, in situations that are narcissistically abusive or in situations of that aren't serving them in their life? Mm -hmm. How can they start to see little signs that it's not working? The first thing I would implore anyone who's wondering whether they are in a toxic relationship or not to do is instead of outwardly reacting when something happens in the relationship that's off or, you know, I used to always tell my therapist, I would be like, how could she do that? I can't believe she did that. I can't believe she said that. I can't believe he did that. I can't believe he said that. Just about relationships in general and and um, like family uh, relationships with friends, with romantic partners. I would also always ask that question. How, how could he say that? And I would, I would, my body language would shift like, how could he say that? And it's like, I'm looking somewhere else wow. for clarity. Mm -hmm. And my ther therapist pointed that out to me. And she said, you need to stop asking, how could he say that? How could she say that? You need to stop saying, I can't believe she said that. I can't believe he said that. And start saying, and look ahead. Start saying, wow, you did just say that. Mm-hmm accept it. Instead of asking why, say, wow, that just happened. Mm -hmm. That actually just happened. Yeah. So I would say, start going inwards instead of saying, how could they do that? How could they whatever? How could they speak to me this way? How could they treat me this way? Go inward and say, how does it feel mm -hmm. to be spoken to this way? How does it feel to be treated this way because your body has been with you since the moment you took this first breath on earth. So since before you can even remember anything, your body has registered what safety looks like. And if your body for the longest time has accepted living through toxicity because, you know, as a child, you don't know, and you've your body has adapted over the years to sit, even though there's a lot of discomfort internally, there's somehow a comfort in sitting with that toxicity being spilled on you when you, as an adult, go inwards and say, little me, how does it feel to be spoken to this way? How does it feel to be treated this way? You will start feeling sensations somewhere in your body. For me, it was always my arms. My chest would feel like I couldn't breathe properly. You know when a yoga teacher tells you, take a deep breath 
and let it go all the way to your tummy. Mm -hmm. I couldn't. I would feel like my breath would stop right mm -hmm. here and I was going to suffocate. I couldn't do it. And it's because I had pushed down so many feelings and emotions that I thought I didn't have the right to feel, like anger, rage, like wanting to speak up because I never thought those things were possible mm -hmm. for me. They weren't safe. If I had done those things when I was younger, there was no way that I was going to be safe. So when adult me says, how does it feel to be feeling this way? Then your body is going to start telling you, we don't feel good around this. We actually don't feel good around this. We've learned to survive it, but we don't feel good. So when you start healing that body of yours and breaking the patterns, um, breaking that the trauma cycle mm -hmm. or allowing a, a, a trauma response from your earlier years to be released from your body, then you start perceiving this person that you're in a toxic relationship with as they truly are. Mm -hmm. You stop seeing them as someone who Maybe if they changed the way they spoke to you, you could change your belief about yourself that you deserve to be spoken to that way. You stop seeing them as someone who's so familiar from your past that you need to change them so that you could be saved or rescued by someone outside of you. Because now you are your rescuer. You are your saver. I'm not going to say savior. You are the person who's going to save you. You are the one who's going to go back to the earlier stories because going inwards when you're in a toxic relationship will take you back to earlier stories in your life. This is one of the most powerful things I've done. To go back to, for example, eight-year-old me who was sitting in a room at my aunt and uncle's house and my aunt came in and said, it's family time. And she took her kids and they went to another room and they all opened gifts right before a big celebration we had. And I'm sitting in that room alone and I'm internalizing the belief that I don't deserve that. Mm. The love, the happiness, the being included, the feeling like someone prioritized me and got me a gift. And I internalize that feeling. So in navigating toxic relationships, going back, to that young version of me, instead of waiting for someone like my aunt or my uncle or my mom or my dad to walk into the room and do the right thing and say, that's not right. Like, you deserve a gift. You are part of the family. You deserve to be prioritized. Instead of waiting for them to do that or for a man in my current life to come in and buy me the gifts and consider me and whatever, I can walk into that room, <laughs> I'm going to cry, as adult me and say, Najwa, do you want to be here right now? Mm -hmm. Let's go. And just imagine walking myself out of that house. That was one of the most therapeutic things I did for myself. And it's one of the most therapeutic things anyone can do, especially if they're in a toxic relationship. Because you're waiting for the person who's with you to change a story about you that you started believing when you were very young. That's why you're stuck in that dynamic. So go inwards, feel what it feels like, get to know yourself, get to know the younger versions of you, forgive yourself for all the times that you actually judged yourself for mm -hmm. staying in the relationship when really what you needed was to say, I know how hard this is. I know that even though on a logical level, I knew this, this wasn't right, I knew I deserved more, my body didn't know any better. My body knows how to survive this. You need the, the compassion, the forgiveness. You need the crying shoulder, and you can be all of that for yourself. But it begins with going inwards, and the signs will start coming up. You'll start, you'll start seeing that toxic person's behavior even more clearly. Things that for the longest time you accepted because that's just how things were, and that's just how that person was. Like, for example... Um, let's say you got used to them not getting you gifts for your birthday, for your anniversary, for whatever. And for the longest time, you knew that if you spoke up about this, it was going to cause a big issue. They were going to accuse you of being greedy. needy and greedy. Mm -hmm. and, and so you were like, you know what? I choose the relationship over the gifts. That's just an example. But once you start going inward and 
becoming more self-aware of who you are and what you deserve and what your principles and values are. And you're like, gifts aren't about gifts. They're about the thoughtfulness. They're about feeling like this person is celebrating me. And there will be one really insignificant in the grand scheme of things event when, when you know that your partner should get you a gift for it or flowers or something and they don't and you will be like, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I want to be celebrated when I accomplish something. I want my birthdays just once a year when, you know, when, when I never had people take care of me during days like that. I, I want something like that and I deserve something like that. You'll have that clarity about their actions that somehow gives you permission to now be angry about things that you never thought you could be angry about. It's like something from inside of you says, I'm done living inauthentically. I'm done pretending that I'm okay with certain things just because I've been made to feel like if I'm not okay with them, something's wrong with me. I have the right to be upset at this. I have the right to say something here. And I'll end up by saying this. This is a really powerful lesson I learned too. You can walk in someone else's story just make sure you don't walk out of yours to step into theirs. Mm. You can still be in your story while you walk in someone else's story. You can give them the empathy. You can understand their childhood was awful. You can understand they were surrounded by relationships like that. You can understand that and have empathy for them. But don't abandon yourself to meet them where they need to be met. I feel like on that so much. Sorry, when I start talking, no, I don't I need stop. my girl. I'm just going to church with my girl. I'm like, all right. It's profound and I'm being healed in the moment. I feel like I've noticed a trend with women, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, where there is, it does seem to be like women are abandoning themselves to have their needs met with men that are technically more avoidant from an attachment mm -hmm. perspective. And this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, especially being new to dating, where I have really, because I'm in, now I'm in more conversations with women that are dating. Yes. So I'm able to see patterns and I'm able to notice things. Do you feel like, what do you feel like is happening? Because I have noticed women just accepting literal crumbs. Mm -hmm. And I, and I love men. This isn't like men versus women. I think men are obviously in pain too. Yes. From men. But I've noticed women accepting crumbs and just over indexing, over functioning, doing all the things. And there's this like unbalanced dynamic where both aren't happy in the end. Mm -hmm. What do you see going on in the relationship dynamics between men and women today where it feels like there is something where women over are over-functioning and men are avoidant to love? Mm. Well, I definitely think things have probably always been this, been this mm -hmm. way, but now with the rise of social media mm -hmm. and women connecting with one another and sharing stories, it's like, oh, I'm not the only one going through this. I think men are conditioned from a young age, mm -hmm. obviously, not to show emotion, not to, and I know this is very basic information, yeah. but, but the thing is, we forget that child you yes. turned into adult you. Like, we, f we forget that those aren't two separate people. It's not like, once you hit 18 or 19, that's it. Mm -hmm. There's a new story and all of a sudden you you learn how to feel or you learn how to deal with things or you, you learn how to not put an end to every story where there's a little tiny bit of resistance. And I think that's what many men do sometimes. If they are avoidant, they will just say, well, you know what? There's plenty of fish in the sea. I can go out, go out and find someone else, especially now with dating apps and whatever, but if they don't take the time to become self-aware, and I've been really pleasantly surprised and just delighted at seeing the number of men now who are willing to talk about their feelings, who are willing to just open up about the built-up shame and to open up about the patterns that they carried into their adult years and how they just, they had to make the choice at one point to say, I need to be available for the people I love. I need to open my heart. You know, um, one thing I've noticed is that many men worry about being controlled 
Yes. And it's like huh. being asked for <clears throat> communication doesn't mean you're being controlled. Mm -hmm. Like that's just communication. If your partner calls you or texts you, that's not their attempt at controlling you. That's their attempt at saying, you're my person. I love you. I want to share something about my day with you. And, and it's like a, it's a bid for connection mm -hmm. to try to communicate. So I think what's, what's happening is that we are becoming more and more aware of the things that both men and women have been conditioned to do from a young age with, with especially the last, I would say, what, since Facebook came into existence, when real people could reach real peop people across the globe, mm -hmm. wherever, and with any story. And so it's like, we are learning about these things that have existed for a very long time. Women have been trained to, you know, you need to be married by a certain age and have kids by a certain age and you have your biological clock and you need uh, you need a man for protection and we've been conditioned for that and men have been conditioned to be protectors and to, you know, you can't show emotion. There's one, I think it's a, it's a TED Talk by Brene Brown where she says, I had a man come up to me and said, I loved your speech about shame, but... What about shame for men? Because as much as my daughters love me, I'm pretty sure they would never want to see me like fall or stumble because they look at me as, mm -hmm. you know, I'm the strong figure in their life. I'm the one yeah. who never cries. I'm the one who like, I would love for you to talk about that. And so it's like many men genuinely don't know how to deal with things and they look at therapy as a threat. Yeah, in some way. Or it's like an admission of weakness. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not. And I'm I'm careful when I talk about men and women because I don't want people to think, and I'm sure you you're the same. I don't want people to think that like I put them in two separate groups and I'm like good, bad. Mm -hmm. No, it's not like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. I just think with the many women I've mm -hmm. also spoken to and the many men I've also spoken to, many men who are very much healed and continuing to heal and who have a very healthy definition of what it means to be a man, of what it means to be masculine, and um, and, and a very beautiful awareness mm -hmm. where when you describe to them a toxic behavior by a man who's in your life, they will tell you exactly which insecurity it's stemming from mm -hmm. and why this man is trying to do this to you, from the many conversations I've had, I know that there is a way where the two of us could meet somewhere, where we can stop being so avoidant. Because yes, you as a woman might be, for example, in a relationship with an avoidant man. You might be carrying the weight of the entire relationship, the emotional load, the everything. You do everything and he just exists in the relationship. If that's the case... He's being avoidant from his own emotions and from his own needs and wants. And even though to you it might come across as very selfish, but he is being avoidant from the things he really needs because we all need connection. Mm -hmm. We all need to be seen for who we are. But I think many men in particular fear that if they, if they open up to you and you see them, that you're also going to see the ugly parts and that you're going to run away. And that also means that they also feel ashamed of all the ugly parts within them. And there's no shame in that. But on the other side, if you're talking about a woman who's carrying that entire load of the relationship, even though she could be very present with this man that she's with, very attuned to him, she is avoidant from herself mm -hmm. and her needs. She is abandoning herself to be there for someone else and also for the dream of what could be with someone else because there's a story there. You know, I need that happy ending. I need the the I need that man to change in some way or I can't be someone who left this relationship when all of my friends are in relationships or I can't be the one who leaves this marriage when all of my friends are married. There's a, there's a story there where this woman is probably avoiding everything that she needs for herself so that there's a little bit of external mm -hmm. medicine. It's kind, of, it's kind of like you cut your hand a really deep cut and you're just 
covering it with a Band-Aid. Mm-hmm. That's not what it needs. It's, it's going to get infected over time. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing that happens with us. So we start having to chip away at who we are to stay in that relationship. Mm-hmm. And it just becomes like two, you know, two humans who instead of coming closer together are actually repelling each other because now we're seeing everything wrong with each other. You know, the woman might see the man as avoidant, emotionally unavailable, horrible person, mm-hmm. selfish. And then the man might be seeing the woman as needy and controlling, controlling and this and that, overbearing. <laughs> and it's like, mm-hmm. have you, well, have we forgotten the purpose of relationships? Mm-hmm. You get into a relationship for connection, to live a life with someone, mm-hmm. to continue living the life you're living. You're, you're continuing on your own path. So are they. But you're also building something together. If you're going to get into a relationship and after a while start noticing that things aren't working out, it's probably better either to sit down and have a real conversation and see if this person is willing to work on themselves and work to make this relationship work or end it if if they say, I'm not willing to work on This is who I am and you have to accept me as I am. End of story. Then you have to ask yourself, is this someone that I want to be with? So if any woman is listening and she's thinking to herself, I'm in that kind of relationship where I do everything and, you know, how can he not see my value? And I'll ask her, how can you not see your value? You deserve so much more than this. I'm not saying it in a demeaning way at all. I know that you know your value. I know that you know what you deserve. You don't need that one guy to see your value for you to know that it exists because trust me go hang out with a few other people and it will be refreshing for you to see that when you do step into your power and when you do live in a very true way to yourself or you're not being filtered you're not feeling like your boundaries are being crossed at all times and and you're just having to let go of so much of what it is that you want and you like and you need just to please this person. When you can be around people who just look at you and say, you're great as you are. Mm -hmm. Like, relax. Let me do this for you. Let me help you with this. You don't have to do all of this alone. You'll start restoring your healthy vision toward yourself because that toxicity kind of blurs everything mm-hmm. and you're, you're snapping back into survival mode and you're just like, I'll do anything for this to work. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it takes like, I was going to say months, but sometimes it takes years after you are out of a relationship like that to see how bad it was mm-hmm. for you and how like unavailable that person was, how clearly they didn't want to be mm-hmm. with you. But, you know, you you took little crumbs, crumbs. little indications like um, obviously that you've been trained to see as huge gestures over mm-hmm. time. Like if they're never ever, when I talk in The Only Constant about trauma bonds, I say when that person who at the beginning showed you so much kindness and so much love and so much consideration, they just, they they gave it to you for free. Mm-hmm. And then bit by bit, they started taking it away not in such a big, massive way where you could pinpoint it, but then you get to a point where you're like, wait a minute, I'm not getting anything at all anymore. What's wrong with that? And so when that happens, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, maybe they sense that now you're pulling away and they give you a little tiny bit of kindness. They send you a sweet message. They buy you a gift that they know you've been wanting. And you see that as so huge because you haven't gotten in so long. And so that's why we get stuck in things like that. So if you really want to end a relationship like that, or if you really want to avoid getting into relationships like that, get to know who you are and be yourself. I'm so fascinated when you're talking about the balance of relationships with ourselves and with others Mm -hmm. of having hope, but also being in reality. Mm -hmm. 
And it's such an interesting dance because for ourselves, we need to have hope yes. for our change, but we also need to be in reality. Mm-hmm. What is actually happening in our relationship? What is actually happening in our life? What is, like, even when you said in a few of the examples, it's like being clear, like, oh, they said this thing, like your example in therapy. I can't believe they did this. I can't believe they did that. It's like, what are you being real with yourself about that you're accepting this thing or doing this thing? What do you think is a good way for people to think about that? Because we obviously want to have hope for our change, for our deep love, for our safety, for our vulnerability in relationships, but we also want to be really honest with ourselves about what's happening today. Mm -hmm. What I would say is focus on what is within your control, which is yourself. Mm -hmm. You can have hope for the relationship, but it can't extend beyond you doing the best that you can to show up as best as you can for yourself and for that person. It can't extend past that. You you can't teach your partner to be the right partner for you. Mm-hmm. You can communicate. You can explain how their behavior made you feel. You can give them a different perspective if they're open to it. But there's there's one really powerful sentence that I use in The Only Constant where I say, If rain falls on a water-resistant fabric, it'll just trickle off. And if your love, your help falls on a, you know, love and help-resistant heart, a person who's just not willing to take it in or not willing to look at what it is that's putting up that barrier for them to take it in, it's just going to trickle right Mm -hmm. off and you're going to be exhausted. You need to be investing that in yourself. Mm -hmm. The hope should be as real as it possibly can. It can't just be, I'm daydreaming about the day when this person will change and come back. And people don't want to change. It's, it's, people like things staying the same. Even though when they, even though they might want something different, they don't want to do what it takes to get that different thing because it's uncomfortable. But think of, us in relationships when we're like, I don't want to change the relationship. I want the relationship to change. I don't want to change the relationship. I want the person I'm with to change. Right? And then why don't we say to ourselves, I want to change myself. I want to change my perception of who I am. I want to change the way I project myself into the world because you know what? I've been acting small. I've been minimizing myself. I've been looking at myself as somebody who never gets angry and somebody who just is very understanding all the time and somebody who's very patient. And maybe I think of myself that way because I don't think I have permission to be loud and speak up. Maybe it's because I don't think I have permission to actually live out my life in a way where I tell people no, or I tell them, I'm sorry, but that's a, you know, that's BS. I don't believe what you're saying. Like many of us don't want to see ourselves that way because we look at it as, oh, that's bad, especially Mm -hmm. for a woman. Like, you know, be kind and be sweet sweet and, you know, they'll come back Mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll see your value. They'll whatever. And it's like, be smaller. Be smaller. Have less needs. Yeah. Have less wants. Yeah. Don't be. And then <laughs> there's sometimes, I've never talked about this in an interview, but this topic has been on my mind a lot with, you know, we talk about pick me girls, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the the women who are like, you know, I, I don't really care. I let my boyfriend do whatever he wants to do. And like, you know, I, I don't get upset if like mm-hmm. he goes out with his buddies and doesn't answer me all night or I don't, I don't really care if he goes for days without talking to me or, and you listen to that and you're like, so you have no needs. Yes. Not, not only that. So you have no needs, but you are also trying to gaslight me Uh out of the validity of my own needs. Mm -hmm. Like you want to be okay with your boyfriend, not being communicative and not being respectful and not being loving and caring and considerate. Be okay with Mm -hmm. that. That doesn't mean I don't have the right to have an issue with mine being X, Y, and Z, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are in that position where 
you you are in a group of people where there's one or a few pick me's. I, I know it's a negative thing, but obviously mm-hmm. when yeah. uh, when we speak like that, we are trying to protect ourselves. Yes, you know, one hundred percent. A woman who says, or even a man who says, I don't really care about the way that my partner behaves or the way it makes me feel. It's like, yes, you do. Mm-hmm. You're trying to pretend like you don't care because you mm-hmm. think caring makes you weak. Yes, right. Mm-hmm. So if you are in a position like that, remember. You can walk in other people's stories. Make sure you don't step out of your own. Remember that sentence. You have the right to have your own standards. You have the right to have your own needs and wants and have those met. You have the right to transparency in your relationship. You have the right to communication in your relationship. You have the right to sitting down and talking about things in your relationship. You have the right to clarity in your relationship. Because that's one thing now with the rise of situationships mm-hmm. and the terms like benching. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, Mm-mm. but it's like when you— I'm so <laughs> new to this whole game. Like you put someone on the bench where okay. they're like— They're, they're you, waiting you until— They're waiting for you. Okay, You'll until someone them, else. Okay. You give them a crumb here and there because you have great someone you're— prioritizing and you're like, just in case this doesn't work, I have that person. Great. Got it. So with the rise of all of that, you have to be willing to tell the person that you're with, this is where I am in our relationship. This is what I'm expecting. Where are you? You have the right to be clear on what this is and where it's Mm -hmm. headed and what their intentions are. You have the right to that. But there's a lot of messaging that's like, don't don't take the lead, especially as a woman. Yes. Don't t- take that lead in a relationship. Yes. Wait for the guy to be yep. to just look at you and be like, you know, she doesn't need anything. She's great. She's um, what's the term that Taylor Swift uses in her song "All Too Well." Um, I know zero Taylor music. Do you? Sorry, guys, I'm zero percent Swifty. <laughs> There's one line in "All Too Well" that I don't just hate. So I just great. don't know. But it's like um, a never needy, ever lovely jewel, I think mm, she says. Never needy is interesting. Yeah. Whose shine reflects on you. Wow. So many times the people that we're with are only with us because of the way that we make them look. Yes. Because of the way they are perceived as a result of being with someone mm-hmm. like us. So you have the right to know what this person's intentions are towards you. And you have the right to, based on their behavior, call them out Mm -hmm. and say, you don't have to say it like, oh my God, how could you do? You can sit and say, you know, when you said this, this is how I felt. I would like to talk about that. But again, there's a messaging that's like talking, having conversations, mm, just go out and have fun. Yeah. Like that's not It's just all unconscious too. And it's, Yeah, and I feel like there is a fear of actually speaking your needs or desires and being clear. There's like a fear of clarity. Yes. Being like, hey, what's your intentions with this? It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. (laughs) Can't we just have fun? Yeah. And you're like, what is that whole thing? Yeah. And that's like almost the pick me girl is almost like the cool girl. Have you heard of the cool girl trope? Yeah. It's kind of like the same thing where it's like you kind of disregard your needs and desires to be seen as cool. And I think it's interesting with the pick me and the cool girl because it also has the subconscious desire for men to validate you, it's like kind of goes against women because you're talking down about women and women's natural desire for communication or connection or whatever, empathy. And then you're like, oh, you guys are losers. You want these basic human needs and desires in a relationship. And all these men are like, oh, you're so great. Yeah, they're like, she's (laughs) sick. She's not going to talk on Sunday when we watch football. (laughs) I was watching this reel my friend sent me yesterday of this girl that was going through a bunch of online dating profiles where all these men were like looking for someone that doesn't take themselves too seriously. And it was like 600 of them. Wow. Being like someone that doesn't take themselves too seriously, someone that doesn't take themselves too seriously. And just repeatedly, and I was like thinking about that. And there could be a different meaning that the men have, but a part of me feels like it's them saying they want someone that's not going to talk to them with clarity and communication about their needs and desires. Yeah. Because for some reason, it does feel like for some people that's confronting. Yeah. To be like, hey, what's your intention? Or like, how are you feeling about our relationship right now? It's like, Mm -hmm. whoa. Do you think it's because they haven't been able to process their feelings or emotions? Or what makes it so scary for people to communicate? I think there's a lot of defensiveness Mm -hmm. that comes from 
perceiving every attempt at communication as an attack on them. So let's say, let's say we're in a relationship and I tell you. Love it. Yeah, I tell you, you know, when you um, said that thing to me last night, um, maybe it's a mean comment. When you said that, it really hurt my feelings. They're not listening to your feelings. Like you're not listening to my feelings. You are immediately thinking, I'm being criticized. I'm being told that I did something wrong. So then you go back to your patterning. When you were younger, were you always criticized? Most likely. Did you know how to deal with it other than to completely shut down and leave the room or take the shame, take the blame? No. So you're going to do that with your partner. So that's what happens is defensiveness. And again, if you are in that situation where your partner gets defensive anytime you attempt to communicate, to express your feelings, and then you end up feeling like there's a problem just because you actually brought this up, you are not the problem. You are being made to feel like you're the problem for having a grievance, having a very natural human reaction to something that happened. You are being made to feel like you're being punished for feeling, for for just being yourself. And so you might start to <laughs> evaluate whether every single time something happens, you, you're like, is it worth it for me to bring this up? Because last time we did this, we didn't talk for four days. Do I want to do that? You start taking the responsibility yes. for their behavior. They are the ones who are doing things that are hurtful and disrespectful. And you are the one who's like, push it down, push it down, push it down. Because if you bring it to the surface, there's going to be a problem. They're going to threaten to leave you. They're going to tell you to leave. They're going to go to the pick me's in the group and say, I, can you believe she said yes. this? Like, uh, you know, after like having she never so, asked him to tell her how she yeah, feels. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, go learn from her. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If you are in that kind of relationship, I would, again, implore you to, instead of, I'm guessing that every single time you brought up an issue and there was defensiveness or whatever, this has happened many times. And you're at the point where you're like, what do I do next? Stop reacting mm -hmm. to their behavior go inwards and ask yourself, instead of saying, where is this coming from? Why is this happening? Don't ask those questions because you're trying to make sense of something that you already know doesn't make sense. What makes sense is if you and I are in a relationship, mm. we love each other, we're connected, you know, we're working towards a life together. If you said something that hurt my feelings... And I tell you, that really hurt my feelings. You know what the healthy thing is? Mm -hmm. To say, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Tell me more. I, I, yeah, I would, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I must have been I'd love just- to know more. Yeah, I must have forgotten that, like, you know, I speak that way to my mm -hmm. friends and now, mm -hmm. you know, there's an openness. All of a sudden you feel safe in expressing mm -hmm. yourself. That's mm -hmm. healthy. Yeah. So if you've gotten to a point where- Every communication, every attempt at communication, there's a wall in your face mm. and you just, you know that this is, the communication thing is not going to work. You're going to go inwards and ask yourself, what's the truth right now? What's reality? Mm. Reality is I heard my partner say these really hurtful words to me that they should never say this to me or to someone that they love. The reality is it hurts a lot. The reality is it reminds me of certain patterns from my past relationships, from my relationship with my parents. It's bringing up a lot of tension in my arms, in my chest, in my heart, in my legs, wherever. I, I used to have like this pain around my eye. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you the story in a little bit, but that the, you start seeing the reality bubble up in your body, telling you like, these are the things that hurt. These are the reactions we used to have when we were younger. This is what I'm feeling right now as a result of this trigger that was represented by my partner saying or doing something that was hurtful. The reality is my partner isn't willing to work on this. Mm -hmm. The reality is I've tried speaking to my partner about this so many times. They do not want to listen. They do not want to change the way they approach it. They are who they are. 
That's reality. The reality is I deserve to be spoken to in a kind way. Mm -hmm. The reality is I deserve to be spoken to in a respectful way. The reality is I deserve to be told the truth. The reality is I deserve to be in a relationship that's Mm -hmm. safe for me, that allows me to be vulnerable and open and to cry and to feel like I'm on the same team with someone, not like I'm being beaten down all the time. And unless I, you know, I imagine it like, think of your entire body and you're like shutting off certain parts of it so that you could be this perfect Mm -hmm. silhouette for that person. The reality is you deserve to be in your full presence, all the good parts and all the bad parts and all the feeling parts and the real parts and the, 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 the hurt parts and the everything you deserve to be that way in that relationship. So when you tell yourself those things, instead of asking, why did this happen? Say, what is the truth? Mm. You stay in your story and you learn to look at them as not as somebody that you just want to shake and be like, how could you be like Mm. this? How could you betray me? How could you not be the person I thought you were? And you say, this is who you are. And if you want to change, it's going to have to be on you. So when you start making the story about yourself, Mm -hmm. as in what's the truth, what's the reality, and this person has tried to make me feel like I'm less, but I know who I am, you start seeing yourself separate from this person. You start, possibilities start popping up in your head of Mm -hmm. all the places you can go and the people you can be with and all the love that you could be surrounded with. I would say begin with that. Mm -hmm. Begin with asking what is the truth instead of asking why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Because you know that that part of the truth is is knowing why that's happening. Mm -hmm. They need to work on themselves. They're defensive. They're afraid of confrontation because they think that from the last five relationships they were with, every time confrontations came up, that person ended up walking away. So now they're protecting themselves. Okay, why is that my problem? So I can know that, but it's not my responsibility to take that away or to fix that. That person is going to have to learn as an adult on their own through either speaking to their friends, through reading a book, through going through therapy, through coming to you and saying, you know what, I genuinely want to change. Tell me what you did and let's heal together. (sighs) That's beautiful Mm -hmm. to have someone tell you that, but that doesn't happen. It's like, okay, well, this is over. Mm -hmm. We'll go swipe and find somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then this is going to happen again next year (laughs) and the year after that and the year after that. Don't focus on on how they're going to move on Mm -hmm. because that's hurtful too. You're like, I can't believe I was this person for six years, seven years, whatever. And now they're they're just going to move on so quickly. I think it's almost a better, like for me, that experience of someone moving on fast was I'm honestly delusional in the best way possible at this point <laughs> in my life. I'm like, that was, I'm like, oh, I'm so grateful. Yeah. Because that shows that they're still attracting at the same calibration level. Absolutely. As before. And so that's great. Like it actually proves that they haven't done any healing. No. And so I can trust and know that there would be a no opportunity for us in our relationship if they've done no healing or no growth, because you actually do need time to recalibrate after a relationship to find, you know, a better one. Um, but it's interesting too, because after toxic relationships when you're in something that's really challenging. This goes back to what you were talking about at the beginning with change. It's like you have to be willing to go the path even if it's not clear. Because I think even when you're in a toxic relationship, you're like, but I can see the path. We're married. We're boyfriend, girlfriend. We live together, whatever. And it's like, it makes sense. But is that a path you want? Exactly. It's like that kind of low level pain that people are in oftentimes, which can be so, so miserable. Mm -hmm. Um, When we think about change, something that was really beautiful that you talked about previously that I really loved, because I kind of want to move to the change topic as a whole, was the three types of change. Mm -hmm. So change that you need to make, changes Mm -hmm. that you don't choose, and changes that you choose. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So when I wrote The Only Constant, I wanted it to be around those three themes, changes we don't choose, like someone dying, someone that you love, someone breaking up with you, losing a job that you really wanted, uh, having to drop out of a program because your grades didn't match whatever you needed. Changes we do choose for ourselves, like getting into a relationship, ending a relationship, um, 
getting into a new program, you know, th- that seems to be like the most change we are comfortable with because we're like, I chose this. Of course. Right? And then changes we need to make. And that's mm-hmm. the hardest one because that's when you wake up to who your authentic self is and what your mm-hmm. authentic life is. So what do you really need to change in your life to live and be on that authentic path? And with the visualization of the path, mm-hmm. you know, showing itself to you, I, I always think of a foggy road when you're driving. Mm-hmm. You're always like, I can't see mm-hmm. like a meter ahead. Mm-hmm but I know I'm going to be able to see in a little bit. And then you see another patch of fog. It's the Mm -hmm. same thing. It's the same thing as imagining a road that has motion sensor lights. And you're like, you know, every time I get close to another one, another light appears, right? And maybe that light comes from within. Maybe as we are walking on that path, we light up our own path. So with changes we need to make, for example... People always ask me, well, how, do I, how do I know like what changes I need to make? I don't really know. You know, because when you close your eyes at night, you're thinking of everything in your life that needs to be different. You're thinking of how easy your life would be if the problems you have right now aren't there. You're thinking of that one person who yelled at you and you're like, oh, I wish I said something back or I wish I dealt with that situation differently. You're thinking of that one person who you just, you don't understand how they treat you the way they do. You know what changes you need to make. You just need to bring those grievances from your mind to the daytime and say, I want to change my life in a way where not every single night I'm sitting there thinking, my life needs to change. My life needs to change. My life needs to change. So let's go back to changes we don't choose, like someone in our life, like dying, or we just, we lose a love that we really wanted. The one thing I talk about is that you need to grieve. And I understand grief is different when we lose someone through death versus losing someone who's alive, but we know we can never be with them. You need to, you need to grieve. You need to take the time to really go through all the emotions and allow the love that we have for them to go to them. Like imagine it going to them because grief hurts mostly when we feel like this big gaping valley of love for someone and it can go nowhere. We feel Mm. like just imagine yourself sending it to them. If someone that you really love broke up with you and decided they don't want to be with you anymore or change the, the, plans that the two of you had and you know you were together for so long you also need to grieve not just the life you thought you had with them but you need to grieve the versions of you that existed in that relationship you need to grieve past you who had that hope who maybe put rose colored glasses on and said you know it'll get better I don't know how but it will this person will change you need to Allow yourself to miss them and not judge yourself for missing them. Um, One thing I talk about is allowing yourself to open your mind up to the idea that it's not just your logic, your mind that makes decisions. You know, when you know you shouldn't be in a certain relationship, you're like, I know better. I deserve better. Like, I know. Mm -hmm but for some reason I can't walk away. So I describe a moment with my therapist where I was talking to her about that. And I'm like, I judge myself so much because I know so much better. Why am I choosing to not do better? And she said, have you considered that maybe your body also makes a choice and maybe your body has survival mode limits that the moment you you even contemplate actually physically walking away from a relationship like this, that your body's like, there's alarm bells going all over the place. This is threatening. This is dangerous. We can't do this. So it's like my body makes choices. Like it's not just all about what I know. It's about what my body knows. And I need to honor that. And I need to honor the pace that it's moving at. Mm -hmm. There's one line also in the book. I forget who said it, but um, it says... I will move as fast as the slowest part of me Mm -hmm. wants to go. And it's like, 
you have to look at all the parts that you have within you, the ones that you're so grateful for, the great things about you, but also the ugly parts, the parts that you don't want there. Like, we all know this. If you close your eyes, there's, and you think, what are the parts of me that I resent, that I hate, that I have? It could be a past version of you. It could be that you're ashamed of a certain part of your identity. It could be that you're ashamed that you didn't reach the potential that your family had for you. There's so many parts that we consider to be ugly. You need to look at all of them and say, I know you are trying to protect me. The shame I'm feeling when my partner might speak to me and I get defensive, the shame that's causing that defensiveness is trying to protect me from an ending that has always said in my mind, this person's going to walk away. When I was younger, if I didn't accept the criticism, I was kicked out of the house. You know, that shame that's causing defensiveness is trying to protect me. Mm -hmm. So when you start looking at all the parts of you as they're actually trying to protect me, but then you, you have to make the decision to step in and say, I know you're trying to protect me, but I need you to trust that I know the way. I need you to trust that I don't need that kind of protection anymore. I want to live a full, open, vulnerable, happy, transparent life. I don't want to hide anymore. I don't want to pretend anymore. Those are really important things to do mm -hmm. when it comes to both change that comes to us unasked for and changes that we're like, I really, really need to make this change to live a life where when I put my head on my pillow at night, I'm like, there is nothing that I would have different. All the imperfect stuff, all the, you know, maybe I thought for the longest time I needed to make this much money a year, but now with the way I'm living, I'm content. Mm -hmm. I'm a person of choice. That's one of the biggest themes in mm -hmm. The Only Constant is that you have to look at yourself as the leader of your life. You have to become a person of choice. Mm -hmm. And that starts with... Looking at your day-to-day -day life, what are you eating? What are you wearing? What program are you in? What kind of relationship are you in? How do you conduct yourself? How do you dress? What are the thoughts that go through your mind? Who chose every single one of these things for you? Was it you? If you go to a restaurant, do you look at the people around you and what they're ordering to see what you should order? Do you say, you guys order whatever and I'm fine with whatever? Where is that coming from? Maybe your whole life you're walking around not wanting to be a burden. But the price of that was that you don't know what you like. You don't know what you want. You don't know what you enjoy. You just hope that you get invited and included so that you can enjoy the feeling of being invited and included. So when you say, I want to become a person of choice, you need to look at all the choices the little ones and the big ones that you make every day and ask yourself, whose choice is that? Where is that coming from? And some people might say, well, my parents made that choice for me and I trust them and I love them. And then ask yourself, is that choice what's in my best interest? Mm -hmm. Because someone who loves me would want my best interest, not their best interest or what would make them look good as a result of me being associated to them in this way and making this choice, you have to become a person of choice. I am a person of choice. Write it somewhere. I choose for myself. I lead. Yes, I get scared of messing up. Yes, I get scared of the way that those who've always judged me and tried to control my life, I, I'm scared that they'll look at me when I fall and say, ha ha, we told you so. Yeah, I'm scared of that. But you know what? I'll do it scared. I'll do it uncertain. I'll do it not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. But if, if you wait until you can no longer take it, you're going to be at the end of your rope and you're just going to be like, I just can't do this anymore. And you're going to explode and just, it's going to be messy. And it's okay if that happens, mm -hmm. but don't think that it has to get that bad for you to have the right to change your life. You can put an end to it now and say, 
I no longer want to live a life where I'm not the one making choices for myself out of fear that people will walk away or that I won't have a community or that I won't be loved or that I won't feel valued or like I'm adding a value. Because often what you're doing when you start speaking that way is (laughs) you're taking yourself out of a box Mm -hmm. that was designated for you and saying, I don't want to live in this box anymore. I want to live in the entire world. I'm tired of like crushing myself together just to fit into this. I want to expand and just be comfortable. Yeah. (laughs) Beautiful. When you were talking about grief, I was like, I felt it in my throat. I was Uh thinking about my dad because he's Mm -hmm. sick and um, multiple things, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and it's been like this, the way that I've been able to touch grief and the way that I've touched grief in the past couple years has been so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Like I've, he's still here. So I haven't got to the point of losing him, but I've touched it. I've knocked on the door of it. And I'm like, whoa, that is, it's next level. Mm -hmm. And before we were talking um, together, before we started the interview, you mentioned something about your dad Mm -hmm. that you you wanted to share. (laughs) Yeah, sure. And then when I share that, after I share that story, there is a piece from The Only Constant about grief that I would like to read, just a short excerpt, but excerpt. Um, So it's the airplane story. That's what I refer to it in The Only Constant. I've never shared this story. Um, So it was around the time when I decided to take the hijab off because I wore it since I was like 13. So this would have been around the age of 28. Now I'm 33 for those listening. So I had brought the topic up to my parents and my dad's first reaction was like, don't even think about it taking it off. But I obviously continued to think about it because I had started, when I started writing, I had started going inward and really asking myself, what do I want? So I continued thinking about it to the point where I ended up taking it off. And I remember my parents were a little bit distant and I could feel like I disappointed them. And you know, they would say, we're worried that maybe you are going through an identity crisis or something, and maybe you don't really know who you are. Maybe you're going through a phase of rebellion or something. And none of that was true. I I think that was one of the most clear decisions that I, I knew this was right for me. You're 28. When I was 28. Saturn return. <laughs> mm-hmm. There you go. Almost like 30. I, I knew. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know the path ahead, just as a side note. I didn't know how to style my hair. I didn't didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. And I learned bit by bit. And I look back at old pictures and I'm like, wow, I thought that looked great. But now I'm looking and I'm like, nope. You know, but that's... Yeah. We're human. You're like, she was fresh. She was just working, working with what she had. Exactly. (laughs) It's, It's what I... The resources I had. So one day my mom called me and she said, your dad wants to talk to you. And so I, I told her, you know, if anything happens where I'm like, I'm not happy, I'm not comfortable, I'm going to leave. And she said, yes, that's okay. So I walked in and we sat at opposite ends of the couch. No hijab and, on. No. And he had seen me without it before, but we just hadn't really talked about it. I just, there was distance. And so he said... And my dad is like a very quiet person. He's very stoic. He's big into philosophy. and and Men so, love using stoicism as a way to not feel emotions. Exactly. It's so yeah, fascinating yeah. to me. It's like, it's, like, it's like you're sitting there and there's walls. They're like, yes, this you. is a perfect way to say I'm yeah. stoic. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, no, you're literally not accessing half of yourself. <laughs> yeah. I read a book on stoicism and I was like, this is making me uncomfortable. <laughs> I know, honestly. Because <laughs> there's no feeling. That's what involved. I want to I want to have Ryan Holiday on because I want to ask about that. Like, how can stoicism be a gateway to feeling more? Yeah. Because I do feel like the protector part of men that doesn't want them to feel, that yeah. is so present, mm-hmm. finds things like that, philosophy, to validate their experience of not feeling and yes. continue to not have them access their heart. Yeah. And they come across as like, I'm calm. And yes. it's like, I'm sure there's 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 rage disaster. under there, dude. <laughs> there. Like, you want to rage right yes, now. <laughs> there's going to be a breaking point. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So He's stoic. He's at he's the table. extremely. So he said to me, you know, when this whole first this whole thing first started, I'm just going to repeat that sentence. Mm-hmm. You know, when this whole thing started, I thought maybe, 
you were going through some kind of identity crisis. I was really worried about you. He said, you know, when an airplane is taking off, it's very important that there's no shakiness, that there's no, you know, going back on the decision to take off until you you hit a point, an altitude where you're like, okay, now we're good. Um, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking, you just started your writing career. People love you. You're new, and I didn't want you to come across as shaky like an airplane when it's first taking off. But now, the more I think about it, the more I'm like, you're not taking off. You're already up there in the sky with the stars, and I shouldn't be worried about you. You know what you want, and you know who you are. And I was like, like, I mean, shocked, shocked. <laughs> very emotional. Yes. When I was reading the audio book, I actually teared up when I was telling that story. And the producer in my ears was like, oh my God, I'm crying. Because I rarely have moments like that with my dad, rarely. And then, so when it happened, it felt like a lightning bolt. Like that's how much emotion hit me because it's my dad. You know, it's someone who I wanted to please my entire life and to hear these words from him meant so much. Mm -hmm. And then right after that, I went through a phase where I resented how hard I had to work to do what I wanted in order to get a moment like that. Wow. Yeah. I am undone. Because <laughs> it was interesting when you said, when he was like, everyone loves you. I was like, what does that have to do with this? Yeah. There was a part of me that was like, because I'm so acutely aware of that now because my parents are very externally yeah. people focused. So mm -hmm. I heard that. I was like, interesting. Yeah. Because it doesn't have anything to do with you. No. But again, I'm sure his intentions were in the right course, place. He's trying course. to tell me, I'm not worried about you anymore. You're You're up there among the stars. And yeah, afterwards, and even to this day, I think back at every big decision I made in my life, whether it was to take the hijab off or to move out before being married. That's a huge mm. deal in our culture mm. for a girl to move out before she's married or to follow the in the footsteps of the writer I wanted mm. to be or to start dressing the way I wanted to dress or to talk on certain topics that I want to talk about. All the the great decisions I made in my life, the, the, the huge changes I made in my life, I had to come up against so much resistance and end up doing it on my own. Mm -hmm. And then after I did it and I went through the pain of it and there was always that relief of like, oh, you know, I didn't ruin that relationship mm -hmm. as a result of me going after this. Like, thankfully, they still accept me. Thankfully, they still tolerate yes. me. And it's mm -hmm. like, why mm -hmm. can't you just celebrate me and be happy for me and be happy with me? Mm -hmm. There's also one part where I talk about um, the people I love. And, you know, obviously that includes my family saying, my love for them doesn't ever question their decisions for themselves. Mm -hmm. My love for them isn't conditioned or conditional on whether they live their life the way I want them to live their life. I never, I never even think of that. I love them for who they are and that's all I ever wanted. Can you give examples though? Because I think that people on the outside would be like, yes, I totally agree. But then seeing examples and actions, people people can see where they potentially do that in their relationships. Okay. So let's say the decisions and changes I'm talking about are like, if you, as my partner, make a decision for yourself that uh, is actually really good for you, like you're deciding to um, take, to get into a program that helps you develop skills in some profession that you've really been wanting to, to work in. I, as your partner, shouldn't be just thinking of how that impacts me and say, I'm not going to love you because you're taking away from the time that you have allocated towards me for so long. Then I'm only thinking of myself, right? Or with the examples I was giving, like with my family, for example, a lot of what would have been going through their minds is subconsciously they're trying to protect me and they want me to be the perfect girl who never makes mistakes, who no one can say one bad word about, the community can't say anything, the, 
But it's like, why are you more worried about all of that more than you are worried about me and my happiness? So I'm not talking about like, my love for you is not conditional on you like going out and cheating or not. I'm not talking about that. Mm. I'm saying your love for the people in your life should not be conditional on them not fulfilling their life stream. It shouldn't be conditional on them sacrificing themselves to be with you. And I honestly feel like the people who need to listen to this are the people who are avoidant in relationships and who are just, they make the whole relationship revolve around them. So if you are in a relationship where you feel like this person is telling you, you know, they're cheating on you, they're lying to you, blah, blah, blah. And they're telling you, you're the insecure one because you don't love me past all of that. You don't see that I'm trying so hard to change. You don't see, it's like they are not listening to your pain and to your grievances and they're not sitting with you in your pain and they are choosing to do what makes them feel good without consideration for you. So don't allow that kind of gaslighting to happen. Your love can be conditional on loyalty. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Your love can be conditional on, and, and here's another term for you, unconditional loyalty. We learn this, many of us at a very young age, through the relationships we see around us, that it doesn't matter how this much this person hurts me, I'm going to stay. Mm-hmm. Like this is what love means is that, that we will mm-hmm. get through all of that. Mm-hmm. And so the story you grow up to believe is I can't leave. Mm-hmm. When men say they want loyalty as like a top three thing, I'm like sketch. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always like, what are you doing where you're requesting loyalty? There's there's, there's like you projection. Should just have it. Yes. There's a lot of projection mm-hmm. when I've heard that before. Like, sketch. The most important thing for me in a relationship is honesty. Oh and then it's like, you're you the to biggest liar. Exactly. And if you yeah. want honesty, you have to be able to withstand it. Yes. When you're like, hey, you're not meeting my needs. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, you're like, I don't want that <laughs> yes, kind of honesty. honesty. I, I want the honesty that only Feeds makes my me ego. feel good. Uh-huh. Yes. Mm-hmm. So um, I forgot what we were talking about. Yeah, unconditional loyalty. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No. It, loyalty is conditional. Mm-hmm. If a person hurts you, and their behavior shows that they are not loyal to you. And, and that doesn't just mean that they don't cheat on you. Loyalty also means that they show up for you, that you can count on them, that you can cry on their shoulder, that you can trust that they will defend you behind your back, that you can trust that they actually, you know that kind of love. Mm-hmm. The kind You see it, you mm-hmm. see it, mm-hmm. where there's a couple and you're like, They respect each other so much. Like they actually have each other's best interest in mind. You you know those relationships. If you're not in one and you want to be in one, stop trying to change the one that you're in and go find that. And you find that honestly by being that and by not being afraid to put an end to something that isn't that. Mm -hmm. But our fears are learned pattern of unconditional loyalty are, again, the fear that we have that that story that we thought we wanted isn't going to end the way that we want it to. Just let go of all of that. That's what living an authentic life is. It's like, I'm not going to try to control this story Mm -hmm. or that person. The only thing I can control is my knowledge of myself. Even if, even if it means, you know what, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of healing left to do. I'm in the process of healing. Um, this brings to mind one thing that a person said to me once. Um, she said, I need to figure out who I am so that I can figure out what I want to do with my life. That comes up a lot. Right? All the so time. we say in relationships too, I need to figure out who I am before I can enter a relationship Mm -hmm. that's healthy or whatever. Or leave. Or leave. People are like, I don't know who I am right now. Mm -hmm. Because that person's telling you who you are. (laughs) Exactly. And you need that healthy distance, right? So I always say, you can be someone. So this is who you are. Mm -hmm. You can, this is your new identity. I am someone who is figuring out who I am. Mm -hmm. I'm someone who's in the process of figuring out who I am. You can 
both learn what you deserve and walk towards what you know you deserve as you are figuring out who you are. Mm. You're not going to be this like picture perfect person before you enter into that next relationship. Mm -hmm. You're you're not going to be the best doctor you could be before you practice for X number of years. I love that because I always say having honest confusion over fake clarity. Because I think so many people are like, I know, and they don't. Yeah. So it's like, if you're confused, you don't know who you are, be honest about it and be yeah. like, I actually don't know. Yeah. Over just saying like, I know who I am. Yeah. And you actually don't. I think in the process of finding the romantic relationship that I feel fully met in, yeah. that feels like the respective, expansive one, which I'm on, I have no doubt that I will be in. But in my journey of that, I actually made my female relationships my playground for like moving me up the ladder and getting me closer to that unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Relationships where I feel respected, where I feel seen, where I feel heard, where I feel met, where I feel expanded, where it's like I'm allowing love to be love and for myself to like calibrate to the love that I desire in my romantic relationships wow. through my friendships. That's amazing. And it's been so beautiful because mm -hmm. I'm like, because I did have that thought where I was like, okay, why do we put so much pressure on the romantic relationship to be the one that's going to be the perfect relationship? And we have no practice for the most part in healthy romantic relationships if you're heterosexual or if you're a man and a woman. And then we expect the next one to be the best one ever. Like I'm using my friendships as like my playground of like, okay, can I clearly communicate how I feel? Mm -hmm. Can I ask for my needs? Can I be vulnerable? Can I um, do all the things that I want to do in my romantic relationships? And it's been really beautiful. Yeah. And also reflect on how you feel in your body when yes. you're around those people, because yes. that should be how you feel around a partner as well. Yes. Not that like, tension or the disassociating. Uh, yeah. I would yeah. disassociate. The a butterflies lot. sometimes, yeah. the yeah. just being on that high, which is normal at the beginning. But if if that's sustained, if you find yourself in a place where the safety you feel around the people you know love you isn't one that you feel in mm. your relationship, that's a huge big waving red flag mm -hmm. for you. That's like something needs to be changed here. Mm -hmm. um, you just reminded me of a story. This is not with a girlfriend of mine. This is with a male friend of mine. This happened a few years ago. I, I completely forgot about it. But it reminded me of the earlier part in our conversation where you talked about men being emotionally unavailable or where you have all these people coming into relationships, but it's like they're not the right ones for each other. Mm -hmm. And I also feel like we always go for there's always that scene in a romantic mm -hmm. comedy where it's like the girl doesn't love the guy who actually loves her. She really wants yes. the guy who like mm -hmm. makes her work hard Crazy for that love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that's, and that's the end. The best that, friend always gets like left behind yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, they're a secondary character, but really mm -hmm. we should make them the main character. So I had this one guy friend who it was, we lived in two separate places. So it was a long distance friendship, you could say. And we would talk for hours on the phone. Like this guy would call me sometimes on a Friday night, sometimes on a mm -hmm. Saturday, and we would talk for hours. And it was always like, I feel like I'm talking to myself. Yeah. Like it, I never got sick of the conversations and it was the same thing at his end. And then I remember one time when we finally met, we're talking, 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 and then he just paused. And he's like, um, you know what I noticed about myself is that I always go for women who make me feel like there's something I need to change about myself because when I feel like that's their requirement for me to like achieve their love, then it motivates me to change that one thing in my life. And so I, I was like, you know, that's, he's very self-aware, right? So I'm listening. And then I went quiet and I was like, have I ever made you feel that way? And he was like, lost. He's like, no. Mm. He's like, I'm in love with you. <laughs> yeah. But then, but I even spoke to him about that. Like a few months mm. later, I said, you know, would you consider us getting to know each other mm. in that way? Yes. I've never shared this story before. Mm. I actually forgot about it. Mm. But now that you're talking about growing with yes. friends with female friends, I, I thought of him. 
And I often think back to that story and I'm like, this would have been so beautiful Mm -hmm. because uh, there was another time when he said to me, you're like my mirror. Like when I speak to you, I actually feel like I see myself. And now I think about it and I'm like, what the hell? Yeah, honestly, (laughs) where's this man? (laughs) Right? Yes. Friends? Are you friends? No. We talk from time to time, but it's, you know, after I... I asked that question, like, would you like to get to know each other in that way? It was very respectful. It wasn't like, oh my God, I'm crazy about you. It was very healthy, very, like, just very mature. Is that something you're willing to, like, think about? And he said he wasn't ready. Mm. And I didn't take it too hard. Mm -hmm. I I don't know why. Like, even now as I'm thinking Mm -hmm. about it, you know, I still smile about it. Because that was such a beautiful connection. But I... When I think back to him, I think to myself, I genuinely don't know why there is that fear to be with someone who's your mirror, to be with someone who's never made you feel like you need to change something Mm -hmm. about yourself. Mm -hmm. You could just be who you are and you're accepted and loved. I'm like, that's what I want. I know. (laughs) I think when you're done striving and you realize after all the striving and all the achieving, that all you want to do is just be accepted. Yeah. And when I think you truly accept the parts of you that are just foul to the mm-hmm. old parts of you, and you truly go in and you find that, you're like, that feels good. But I think there's an aspect of our experience where we always feel like we have to be working towards something. Yeah. And so we're kind of addicted to that feeling. And we feel like if we have a calm nervous system or we feel like easy with someone, it doesn't feel right. Yes. Because we've just been programmed to really go after the chase, go after that hit, go after the dopamine of the person that's like challenging or the trauma bond. Yes. We know what it feels like. I know what it feels like in my body when I'm like, like, whoa. Honestly, it is intoxicating. Yeah. You're like, it it makes me think and say crazy stuff. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, oh, I'm so processed. Literally, I'm like, I'm so processed. Then I'm like, it's okay that he lives with his friend. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just like negotiating my standards. I'm yeah. Like, <laughs> Don't negotiate your change with people who want you to stay the same. Mm. That's another thing I wrote about in there. Mm. Do not negotiate your change with people who are comfortable with this version of you. Mm. With people who don't want you to have higher standards. Yes. With people who don't want you to have needs. And it was beautiful what you just said because all I could think of was the very first thing in the changes you need to make is number one, stop trying. Mm-hmm. Stop trying to earn that love. Stop trying to, to earn that approval, that acceptance. Stop trying to be included. Stop trying to change people's minds about you. Stop mm-hmm. trying to portray this image of someone who you think deserves to be loved and respected because you, as you are, deserve to be loved and respected. And people who reject certain parts of you and tell you, when you knock on my door, leave those parts at the door. That's the only way you're welcome. Those aren't people whose doors you want to be knocking mm-hmm. on. So you need to stop trying. A life where you're constantly fighting mm-hmm. is addictive and because you win something at the end mm-hmm. and proving but a life where you can sit back and rest and relax and know when to anticipate that little bit of anxiety Mm -hmm. when you have a deadline coming up, when you have a hard thing in your life coming up, that's, that's, that's a peaceful, beautiful life where you embrace change and you know that things are ever changing. But one thing that isn't is that I know who I am and I know what I want and I know what peace looks like to me Mm -hmm. and I know what I deserve and what I'm willing to accept. And what I'm not willing to go below, you know, I'm not willing to accept crumbs. I'm not willing to lower my standards or stay a version of myself just so that certain people could say, you deserve this. You deserve that. You're great. You're so kind. You never, you never have a grievance. You, everybody loves you. Like, I don't want that anymore. And that's, that's, it's scary to let go of that. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, I was going to say one thing that I think everyone should should reflect on. Life is hard enough and making the changes in your life that you know you need to make are hard enough. Life is hard enough when someone that we love gets sick. Life is hard when a child we have is going through a really difficult time. Right? Life is hard when, when we're going through something, when our hormones are changing, when we're aging, when we're this, when we're that. 
the hard part about life should not be how much the person in your life who should love you is loving you. The hard part shouldn't be convincing them that you deserve love. That's not the hard part. That shouldn't be the hard part of any kind of relationship that you have. To convince someone that you deserve love, to convince someone that you deserve respect, to convince someone of what your value is, that shouldn't be the hard part. If that's the hard part, go choose another hard. Mm -hmm. That should be the easy part is I know that love is there. It's stable. It's consistent. It's open. It's vulnerable. I'm not going to think that every single action I do or word I say is going to threaten that foundation going away. Mm -hmm. If that foundation is unstable, the whole thing is going to fall apart right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with our relationship with ourselves. Mm -hmm. So think of that foundation. Do I accept myself? Am I aware of who I am and my patterns? Am I aware that when my body starts feeling like it's tense and when I sleep like this at night, that that's triggering something from my childhood where I feel like I'm in danger? Am I aware of that? Because if I am, then I'm going to go inwards and say, what happened today for me to be sleeping this way? That's how you know who you are. And that way, when someone enters your life and they try to dabble with your perception of who you are, you say, that's not working because I know who I am. You're telling me I'm a liar when I know I'm a very honest person. You can leave. But when it, that, there's that shaky foundation and there's gaps and places that need to be filled, you're like, I'll take this. I'll take whatever I can get. Sure, you're right. Maybe there are things about me where there are times when I'm not being honest. And like you're saying it and, and you know it's not the truth. But you know that that's the price of keeping them in your life. So I want everyone to reflect on that. Is the love part and the respect part and the valuing part the hard part of that relationship that you have? If it is, mm. bye. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Better Help. Y'all, I get a lot of questions about therapy. I've been in therapy for, ooh, I think it's like six years now. Ooh, it's been the best. It's been the best investment I've ever made in myself, investment of money and time and energy. And it's the gift that keeps on giving. If you are on the fence about therapy, let me tell you that therapy on a biweekly basis has totally changed my relationship with myself, with other people. It has improved my ability to just experience success, whether it's in my career, uh, in my relational life, um, and in just a a, a purpose sense. I've really connected to my purpose. I have gotten to know my inner world unlike anything else and it's helped me to be a better person and I just cannot emphasize enough how important therapy is and better help is an incredible way to start therapy. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited for your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Super, super easy. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash almost 30 today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash almost 30. I used to be one of those people in my 20s where I just didn't think I had to prioritize wellness. I just figured like I could do the bare minimum and still feel great. But uh, I know that is not true. But in the last year and a half, I came across Aloe Moves. And this has just fortified my belief in incorporating wellness practices every single day. So the app makes it so easy to keep my wellness routine on track because they have everything in one place. There's yoga, Pilates, fitness classes, mindfulness, self-care tips, healthy recipes, and so much more. I actually did a face yoga class this morning. If you've listened to a recent glow up episode, Kristen and I did, you know that I am doing all the facial massage, facial yoga uh, to keep my face nice and taut, you know? Um, So I highly recommend this app actually during my pregnancy and postpartum. This has been my number one way that I am moving my body. They have any type of workout you can imagine for all different levels. And I 
am obsessed with the classes and the instructors, long classes, short classes, different uh, levels. It's great. So beginner to advanced, they have a flow or a class that will fit your schedule. Their classes range from five minutes to an hour, depending on what you're feeling. Um, and they have award-winning workouts like sweat-inducing yoga flows, hit classes, reformer Pilates, um, different classes with weights. I love it. I love it. Uh, if you're someone who's looking for meditations, affirmations, face yoga, like I've been doing, gua sha, dry brushing, uh, journaling for those quiet moments, this app is for you. I love it. I love it. So unlock your personal wellness routine with Aloe Moves. Go to alomoves.com and use code ALMOSTPOD for an exclusive 30-day free trial and enjoy 20% off an annual membership. Pretty major. I would take advantage of this. That's alomoves.com. A-L-O moves.com. The code is almost pod. A-L-M-O-S-T-P-O-D. A-L-O moves.com. The code is almost pod. I love that. I've never thought about that. I love that. <laughs> I would love if you could read the excerpt. Yes. I'm thank excited you. for people to get into the book. The book is the only constant. And it so, is out now. Yes. So the part that I'm about to to read is about grief. Um, A lot of it is about grief for when we lose someone that we love through death, but you can apply it to any other grief in your life. Grief is like a big tide that pulls you in. And for a moment, you feel like you and this reality cannot coexist. That accepting that loss is simply out of the picture. It's impossible. A part of you feels like accepting it will make it real. You feel like You're going to drown in the dark ocean that this tide is pulling you into. So every part of you is fighting to go back to the place where you didn't feel this way. And the more you fight, the harder it becomes to get back to the surface. The real answer is to just let the tide take you wherever it takes you. If it wants to take you to a place where you live in the memories as if they are happening right now, let it. If it takes you to a place where you're sad because you're missing the memories, let it. If it takes you to a place where you imagine how you're going to honor them throughout your life, let it. I know it's scary to do that because there is 0% of you that wants to live in a world where the only way to have that person there is by honoring them instead of seeing them, hearing them, or holding them. If you find yourself resisting that place, no, there's no judgment for that. It's not wrong to have a hard time accepting loss. Even the period of time when you're in denial of their loss is an expression of love toward them. Don't allow anyone to dictate how long or short your grief should last. Love doesn't work that way and life doesn't work that way. You may grieve this person for the rest of your life and that's okay. When you run away from grief, you push the parameters of what you need to heal. You create a bigger circle of grief around you because what you're running away from is within you. It's not like there's any place in the world you could go where the reality of the loss of someone just doesn't exist. To get to a place where you can escape the acceptance of that reality, you take on behaviors that temporarily distract you from that reality. That's why you feel numb by spending extra time at work, creating to-do lists for all the things you feel you need to do to get your life in order, making sure you always have plans so you feel like you know what you're doing, and so on. Some of us go numb by using alcohol and drugs. Some of us go numb by seeking comfort in people. Some of us go numb by pushing away every person who loves us. We obviously don't do this out of not wanting love, but out of fear that they will truly see us and our pain. Because when we are seen for who we are, there is the potential that the ugly parts of ourselves are exposed Mm. to. And instead of focusing on shining all the other parts that need to feel seen and connected to others, we protect the whole of ourselves from being seen altogether. It just feels safer to do so. Grief doesn't wait for the right moment to visit us. It comes when it comes, and it's our choice to welcome it in or not. But as long as we don't welcome it, it will continue to knock until it is able to walk in, sit with us for a while, and then perhaps move into another room in our home. Then it might move out and visit every so often. But by not allowing it in, we are building a protective shield that hinders our acceptance of reality. That was profound. 
Thank you. Yeah, so beautiful. And that was written, inspired by your grandmother. Yes. Yeah. And by knowing that there was no way that I could just push away the reality yeah. that she was no longer there and that that's part of grief. Mm -hmm. And as long as I just tell myself, I don't want to believe that she's gone, it, I'm, I'm not allowing myself to love her in the way that I need to be loving her right now. Wow. Because mm -hmm. if I don't accept that reality, then that love is still in here mm -hmm. and it's, it's trapped. Mm -hmm. And I love her by honoring her. Mm -hmm. I love her by living in the way that I know she would have wanted me to live, to be happy and to feel like I'm being honored in my life. So, yeah, that's where that came from. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> this has been so beautiful. I've been so excited about this one. I just feel so grateful to do what I do and just have conversations like this and just be able to be in my own process of learning and growth and evolution and processing when you're talking about so many things. So thank you for coming. I'm so thank excited. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm so excited about everyone getting The Only Constant, which is out now. Yes. The Only Constant in Your Life is change. And there's one other constant that I'm going to let you figure out when you read the book that's going to blow your mind away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, God. <laughs> You're like, I know that it? constant. <laughs> I'm like, my firm foundation, baby. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys, we'll see you later. Love you. Bye. Thank you so much, Najwa. That was such a beautiful conversation. I'm so grateful to be connected to you. You were so kind and loving. And the book is The Only Constant. It is out now. I'm excited for you guys to check it out amongst our other books. And if you are going through change in any season of your life and are seeking community, be sure to check out the Almost 30 membership. It's a place where we learn, grow, connect, have a really great time each and every month. Go to almost30.com slash membership. Yeah, Almost 30 podcast on Instagram and TikTok, almost30.com. And we will see you on the next one. Love you. Love you. Bye. Bye.